I'd like to welcome you to my pantry. This is like an average pantry. It's just off the side of our kitchen. And it's like a normal pantry, I suppose. We have a lot of our glass canning down on the bottom so you don't drop and fall. And we have a lot of the lighter items up at the top of the pantry. And a mix of food in between. But the other day, I was putting some food away, and I happened to notice something with my kidney beans. Love kidney beans because they're good for chili. But I was looking at the kidney beans, and right down here was the best buy date is December 2018. Well, today it's January 2020. But this food is getting a little bit on the old side, but I really don't want to throw it away. So this is a really good opportunity for people who have a freeze dryer to take foods which are nearing their expiration date or their best buy date and freeze drying them to prolong the life of the food. The information provided by the UFDA which is the Food and Drug Administration, deals with cans that are in good condition. I'd like to share with you a bulletin released from the Department of Agriculture. This concerns uh, food storage, primarily frozen food and canned food that you'd find in your pantry. What I want to focus in to is the section here about canned foods. This bulletin addresses canned foods that you'd find in your pantry. And what I want to highlight here, they're saying that most canned foods in your pantry are basically safe indefinitely uh, if the cans are in good condition and that the food can last for years as long as there's no rust, dent, or swelling of the cans. The article basically states that if your cans are kept at a cool temperature inside your pantry and that the uh, humidity is going to be dry so that you don't have any uh, corrosion forming on the outside of your cans. If you're in a humid place that might be a little bit different. And the last thing is they mentioned if you keep your cans away from heat and direct sunlight. And if you do, th do these three things your cans can almost have an indefinite shelf life. Now, I don't like the word that they use, indefinite, because that's a long, long time. And But there are some benefits about canned foods versus other types of foods you might have in your pantry. Whether you believe in the bulletin from the Department of Agriculture, it comes down to trust and to common sense. Uh, if you believe that the manufacturer uh, can the foods in such a way that it's going to last for many, many years, well, then you're okay. But one of the problems with canned foods is you can't see inside the can. Now, everyone knows the benefits with canning in jars. If your food starts going bad, you can see the food in the jar. You can't see the food in the can. But the downside of jars is jars only have a shelf life to one to two years where cans exceed the shelf life of jars for many years. So that opens up the possibility once again of freeze drying the foods in your cans after they reach so many years. And that determination is gonna be up to you whether you want to freeze dry your food or not. But what if you have a can like this that has a dent in it? Today's cans are lined with a non-BPA epoxy resin, which protects the food from touching the metal side of the can. If the can gets dropped or damaged, the inside resin can crack, exposing the food to the metal surface, and this can increase spoilage. However, the food is not a total waste. Many grocery stores will have shopping carts full of slightly dented food at a substantial discount. And this is one way that having a freeze dryer can save you money. By purchasing this damaged product, you can rescue it 
and freeze dry it and use it for another day. Well, good cans can last almost indefinitely, but cans that are a bit damaged are cans that we need to take a look at. This can right here doesn't expire until 2024. It was just purchased a couple of weeks ago, but it noticed this dent. So that's another thing that you can do with freeze dried food. If you have canned foods that are dented, which might limit the shelf life, those are, can those are foods which would be a good candidate to take out of the can and go ahead and freeze dry. Here are two other good candidates for freeze drying. Here, I got a quart of peaches that was canned in 2020. That's still within the lifespan. This right here is some sauerkraut that is also canned in 2020. This would be a good candidate. So instead of having to force feed myself peaches and kraut or just throwing this food away, I can freeze dry this food and extend the shelf life. That way I will have this food in the future and I don't lose my investment. Plus, another thing about freeze drying is although most of this food in my pantry are in cans, if I freeze dry some of the food, it will also free up additional space for new food. Now here's a good example. Bought several cases of corn from a case lot sale, but by accident, I grabbed one case of cream style corn. Well, I'm not a real big fan of cream style corn, but I'm not going to toss it. But this is going to make a really good candidate to freeze dry. And I will eat it 20 years from now. Anyone who's had a freeze dryer should know by now that fatty and oily foods will not freeze dry. So having vegetable oils and cooking oils is something that you just can't do without. Generally, the shelf life on oils is two to three years depending on temperature and light exposure. So oils is something you'll have to rotate. Tomato sauces, tomato paste, great things to freeze dry. I've freeze dried many of these things and they reconstitute really, really good. Now maple syrup, unopened, will last almost indefinitely along with honey. Honey may crystallize, but it will last a long, long time. A few foods that are almost impossible to freeze dry, well, the big one is gonna be mayonnaise. Mayonnaise does not freeze dry very well because of the fat, but uh, there are also alternatives to mayonnaise. Uh, a lot of the dressings, because of the oil and barbecue sauce, will not freeze dry, but I've had some success with those. I recently made an attempt to freeze dry vinegar and I basically freeze dried it into oblivion. It disappeared off Vanilla. the tray. But vinegar has a long shelf life so you don't really need to worry about that product. Most spices and seasonings do not require freeze drying because how dry they are. However, vinegar can be freeze dried. I had great success with that. So, don't worry about your seasonings. When it comes to canned foods, it's a decision you're going to have to make whether you want to freeze dry them or leave them in a can. But it comes up to a matter of logistics. How much room do you have in your pantry and how much storage room do you have if you want to freeze dry them or not? It's a decision up to you. Now across from my regular food storage I have here, I have my freeze dried storage. Now. Just because you freeze dry something doesn't mean you have to throw everything into a jar or a mylar bag, throw an oxygen absorber in it, and seal it. This is my short term freeze dry inventory. So I have some zucchini here, I have some jalapenos, I got yellow squash, I have zucchini, uh, I have some taco cheese right here, uh, green peppers and I have carrots. So this is my week to week, my everyday supply of food that I can use on a daily basis. And if it comes time that I don't use these carrots after a certain period of time, I can throw these in the freeze dryer again 
along with other carrots and freeze dry them a second time. Remove the moisture and permanently bag them. But you don't have to bag everything that you freeze dry. You can leave it in small, you know, Ziploc bags here for day-to-day -day use. So I found this very helpful to do. So these are my past due kidney beans and they come with a lot of liquid that I really don't like to freeze dry with. I've done kidney beans before and so I will usually separate the liquid out of the beans. So I'm just freeze drying the beans themselves. Having that liquid in there just increases the freeze dry times and just gets kind of messy when it comes time to package them. In addition to draining them, the liquid that's in with these kidney beans and many other beans is like a heavy starch liquid that I really don't care for when I make my recipes. So I will also generally rinse the beans with water so they're just a little bit easier to freeze dry. So let's see else what we got here. We got some applesauce. Uh, that's best used by 2020 and we got some apricot halves well here's a good one these are 2016 so we got these two things now back here I got some mushroom pieces and stems and on the box it says April 10th 2017 so let's see Yep, so April 10th, 2017. So I have an entire case of mushrooms that are going on five years old. So this is going to be a good candidate to uh, freeze dry. So these cans are really small. So I'm putting 12 of these small cans into one tray and I'm also draining all the water out so we have less to freeze dry. 12 cans is the capacity here. Now this is a lot of mushrooms and so I think what I'm going to do when I package this up I'm going to package these in smaller quantities because I'll never use this many mushrooms at one time. Okay, so into the freezer this goes. Here's another great thing about freeze drying soups. Now I went through my pantry and I checked all the expiration dates. Uh, they're, not actually, they're actually the best used by dates of a lot of my cream of chicken and cream of mushroom soups. Now cream of chicken and cream of mushroom soups are the foundations of many uh, dinners. They're almost a necessity to have in your pantry. So I found these which are expired. This one right here was best used by uh, December 4th of 2019. Well today is January 9th of 2022. So this is like two years old. This one right here expired a year and two months ago and then these expired last month. So I have a companion video concerning canned food and uh, their expiration date and that's going to be released here shortly. But basically the issue about canned foods from the USDA basically sh shed some additional light on the expiration and best use by dates, but that's another issue. So what we're going to do, we're going to go ahead to and freeze dry some of my expired canned soups. Now we know one year, two years past due is really not a big issue. I have this one right here that was purchased just last week. So I have this one that doesn't expire 
until April of 2023 and this one right here expired two years ago. So we're going to open this up since this is our oldest and we're going to compare it to the newest. Okay, so as you look at this, this is the one that expired two years ago. This is the one I bought just last week. So this, the texture, the color is pretty much the same. And the smell, is identical. There's no difference in smell between these two soups that are almost three years apart from each other. So the nice thing about condensed soups is the manufacturer has al already removed most of the moisture from the soup. So this is going to be a lot easier to freeze dry because we don't have to worry about so much water. So we're going to go ahead and fill this tray up with this past due soup, we're going to freeze dry it and stick it into our freeze dry pantry. So I was able to put six cans of the condensed uh, cream of chicken soup into one Harvest Right tray. So I'm going to go ahead and throw this in the freezer and pre freeze it. But you know, first we're going to weigh it. In regards to my cream of chicken soup, I dumped everything into a, a bowl here and I weighed this. And the six cans that I freeze dried came out to 290 grams. So this right here, divide that by six, this is 48 grams of chicken, of the freeze dried chicken noodle soup, which is one can. So I went ahead and wrote that on my package that 48 grams equals one can. That way when I use my cream of uh, chicken soup I know how much to put back into a recipe and so it'll just make it a little bit easier to work with. So that's just one of the things you might want to remember about using proportions is recording the information on your bag. Here's another issue I found walking my pantry. And all these have something in common, which could be very important to your food storage. I got my Prina dog chow. I got some Bisquick cocoa. I got some Kool-Aid, Lipton soup, salt, uh, cocoa mix, cornstarch, and some uh, macro, uh, elbows, some uh, pasta. Well, all these items are basically dry items, and they're going to have a pretty good shelf life. But the problem with all these items is the packaging. Uh, for example, cornstarch is basically packaged in cardboard. Now, if you look inside of here, I can get this open. There is a bit of a bag inside the, the cornstarch, but it's ex extremely thin and it's also like a paper bag. So if this were to get wet, your thing of cornstarch is pretty much going to be destroyed. The same as with the salt. The salt is only in a cardboard container. The cocoa's cardboard. The uh, Kool-Aid is kind of a paper with a wax paper in it. I know the, Bis the Bisquick has like a wax paper bag inside of this. This is just cardboard. So. Depending on where you have your food storage, you may or may not be prone to flooding. And wouldn't it be a shame if you had a pipe break or a, a, one of those 50-year floods like you often see on television and it gets to your cardboard paper package materials and destroys them. Now like with the dog food, that's the same thing. And so why not put some of our dog food away for the future and you know because dogs have to eat too so what I'm going to do is we're going to repackage all this but we're not going to use an oxygen absorber but we're going to package it a little bit of in a different way that I think you'll find extremely helpful 
the first one we're doing is cocoa powder. So I've already opened up three of them. I'm putting the fourth one in the bag. Gonna tap those down. Now one of the things I always like to do, when you're using with things that are powdery, sometimes you get a lot of powder around this top uh, area where you're going to seal. I always just like to get my thumb or finger and just rub it all the way around where I'm going to be sealing just to take off any extra powder because sometimes if you have too much powder in the sealing area it won't make a good seal. So what we're going to do, the, the powder is about this high, we're just going to fold this over and that will he help remove any unwanted air and remember there's no, ox there's no oxygen absorber in here. So we're going to come down here and seal this. We're only going to seal it one time. Okay, so that's sealed. And then what we're going to do at the intersection of the manufacturer's seal and the seal I just made, we're going to snip it off just so there's just going to be the tiniest of holes showing. Now there's no need for you to do what I'm doing. I'm just, for demonstration purpose, I'm just trying to show you where this little vent hole is between these two seams. So as long as you cut it and have a little bit of a vent hole here, then it'll work out just fine. We're going to go to the next step. Now the thing about the Bisquick, it has lots of recipes on the outside. And so I'm going to fold flat the entire box and go ahead and slide it in here and sew it up inside. That way I have access to the recipes in the future. Go back and take the vent hole, just like so. Gluten-free biscuit, gluten-free bisquick, and these are already in little teeny containers. And it's a pretty good plastic container, but we're going to do this anyway. So we're just going to put these, the whole thing inside, side by side. And we're just going to put a little stick in it. Now here's one I overlooked, an important one, sugar. If this bag of sugar gets wet from a flood or a broken pipe, then this is just going to be totally wasted. And I'm not sure if you have been just totally outraged or upset, but when you take, you take a look at the price of inflation on food, your pantry is becoming more and more valuable. Okay, so we have an entire bag of food in here, and we're going to go ahead and fold this over, bring this to the edge, and we're just going to put a single sill in the top. And we're going to find the we're going to find the intersection and sometimes it's easier to do it on the back side. But we're going to do a little bit of a snip right at the intersection. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is some dog food. Dogs have to eat too. So I'm going to fill this bag. about three quarters full. I'm going to fold the bag over 
and we're going to go ahead and seal it right at the top. Okay, so we have the manufacturer's edge and our sealed edge right here. And where these two intersect, we're going to come down just about an eighth of an inch, maybe quarter of an inch. And we're going to snip off the top just like that. One last item out of the pantry that would be important to consider would be flour. Now, I'm not going to actually bag this because I need the flour later on today. But if you're going to bag flour, I would strongly suggest to, to put one to two, preferably two oxygen absorbers in with your flour when you seal it. Because even flour, when it goes through the mill, could still have the larvae from uh, grain moss. And you don't want to end up hope opening this flour up years from now and finding a bunch of uh, grain moth egg casings. So if you put two oxygen absorbers in with your flour, the oxygen absorbers will do two things. One, it will remove the air that's inside the flour, plus the better benefit is when oxygen absorbers absorb the air, they give off carbon monoxide. So it's going to create an environment inside the bag with the lack of air and with the carbon monoxide that will probably end up killing any of the grain moth larva if they happen to hatch or whatever the case might be. It's just uh, a way to get rid of them. Next step, we're just going to pull this corner over just a little bit like that and we're going to go ahead and put these in. We're going to do four at a time and then we're going to go back and seal them. So there you go up to the leaf and we're just going to turn the pump on. Okay, we're at two minutes. So we're going to turn off the pump, release the valve. take everything out. Then you just take the corner and you seal the corner up and you're all done. When it's vacuumed, when it's vacuumed like this it gets pretty all crinkly. Everything just gets sucked, sucked in and so there's no oxygen absorber in these. One, they're dry and because they're dry already an oxygen absorber really isn't necessary.